Hello students of history. So today we are going to be taking a look in our lecture uh, about the legacy of English liberty. So I would just encourage you as we begin uh, this tour through a, a, a millennia or even more than a millennia of, of the, the question of liberty. What does it mean to be free? What is liberty? What does liberty mean? Uh, and how has this ancient belief in individual freedom shaped the history of the United States right down to our own time? How have Americans, um, how have English colonists, how have those who have been in, uh, in, in chattel slavery seen and, and played a part in uh, this concept of freedom? How have women uh, played a role in shaping uh, the values that we define as, as our, our, our notions of, of individual liberty? How have Native Americans played a role in this? Um, and ultimately, what are the origins of liberty? And in this lecture, we are going to explore these topics and where all of these values and virtues and, and beliefs and traditional customs and rights uh, come out of uh, in, the, in the mind of modern Americans. And we will explore this through a tour of the English, even the Anglo-Saxon past, the Enlightenment, and finally uh, into the colonial and uh, in, uh, colonial period in the United States, uh, past the American Revolution, and conclude with the uh, the notions of, of freedom that came out in the U.S. Civil War, um, and that then come down to our own time after the the U.S. Civil War. So I would just encourage you to take a moment and to ponder on this. What does it mean for you to be free? What, what do you understand the notion of liberty? And is liberty, as we conceive of it, a universal value through all time? Is this something that is uh, God's gift to humanity that has been uh, passed down through a small island? Or is it something that we invent? Uh, is, it, uh, is it a universal value? Or is it something that has been created in time by, by human beings? So I invite you to think about these things, and we will uh, pick up with my uh, slideshow in just a few moments. So I asked you to ponder on the question of this legacy of liberty, whether freedom is a universal value and how uh, the sense of American liberty comes out of the ancient past. And I think as we ponder on this question of liberty and democracy, there is going to come uh, the question of Western liberalism, that this, this thing that we participate in that we call liberalism, that we define as a free, democratic, uh, free market capitalist society that is often also, though less so in, in uh, the modern West, also Christian. But it is part of this, this idea that we have sort of Western freedom and liberty uh, wrapped up and enshrined in these values. Um, and ultimately, was it the destiny of the American empire to share these values, to give these values uh, to the rest of the world, to export Western liberalism uh, after World War I and World War II uh, to, the, to the rest of the world? Because Americans, I think, have seen freedom as a universal value, that it is something that has been given from the divine to human beings. But I think as we study other societies in uh, the, the colonial past, as we study um, other civilizations, that, uh, other religions, that we, we see that uh, West, the Western sense of, of, uh, of, of liberalism as, uh, as not actually being a universal value, uh, that uh, universal values are, are something that have to be true throughout all time and all place. That uh, freedom, as a as a Western creation, is is not a universal value, but it is something that is essential to understanding the development of the West and specifically the the uh, United States and uh, and 
the colonies, the empire that came out of Great Britain and its, its uh, notions of, of freedom that it has, has exported to the world. So uh, I think that we can't see uh, freedom as a universal value, but we certainly can see its enormous contributions and importance to the United States. So there are threads of, of American freedom and, and American liberty that uh, we can break this category down just a little bit farther. That there are great, this great idea of freedom comes down to us uh, in, in four forms. And it is the legacy of the classical past. And when I say the classical past, I mean Greece and Rome. That the founders of the American Republic and those first colonists who came over were deeply shaped by the classical writers of the past and their notions of, of freedom and virtue and limited politics, that no one magistrate, no supreme ruler of the Roman Republic could uh, possess power independently, that there were checks and balances upon uh, powers uh, within the Roman political system, that it was participatory, that uh, you, had to, uh, you had to show up and vote that certain, certain classes of people based upon their land holdings had to serve in the army in order to, uh, to be able to vote. Uh, um, that these are, are legacies that are given down from the classical past to the founders of uh, the United States and it, it profoundly shapes their, uh, their notions of creating a new uh, Republican uh, system in, in the, in, uh, the post-colonial world that will become the United States of America. Secondly, we have a sense of Christian freedom, that the church should remain independent of the state, that the church and state need to be separate, as one uh, should not have undue influence upon the other. And by separating these two powers, it protects both the church from uh, the, the monopolization of power within the church and, and, uh, and allowing the church to become... Um, a, a another branch of, of the secular government, um, but it also uh, helps to protect the government from uh, becoming a, a theocracy instead of a republic. Third, it is the notion of the frontier, that the United States has long been a frontier, that since uh, 1607 and even uh, slightly before that, uh, with the founding of Jamestown, uh, we see that there is a constant notion of liberty and freedom that come from a frontier that, uh, that whether it be Puritans or planters or settlers or, or whomever it might be come to the United States and they come for this notion of freedom that they can start over again that they can refound a new city uh, on a white hill as, as the Puritan divines will, will report to us. And there is this continuous push that as people expand further and further into the frontiers, uh, that there is this continued notion of freedom, this, this belief in a freedom that, uh, that is about individuals and individual freedoms and, and people being able to work within limited governments. Uh, that people can get along together and that it is almost in a state of nature and on the frontier that that people must interact together instead of of uh, of governments making decisions for people uh, that individuals will make deals and finally and I think most importantly and the deepest and most profound sense uh, of liberty that shapes the United States and, and the Republic that it would become is the notion of English liberty, that people have a right to exercise uh, decisions in government, which we call the vote or suffrage, that individuals might choose the laws and the governments that rule over them, that there is a freedom from foreign control, that no foreign power can exercise influence over the individual, that you are sovereign in and of yourself and that you may have an individual freedom, that you can live as you choose freely as long as you do not harm others. Now there are significant differences between this notion of English freedom that, uh, that uh, comes about in North America and other freedoms uh, that, uh, or other notions of liberty uh, 
that uh, are born in Latin America because of the differing colonial relations. Um, whereas you have England being uh, the, the uh, New England colonies, and then you have the Spanish powers, and uh, to some degree Portugal controlling the vast majority of Latin America and the Caribbean. And there's very, uh, very great differences in the kinds of law systems uh, in, in, in uh, versus the English colonies or the Spanish colonies, and all of Latin America and Germany, and the, the, basically every region throughout all of Europe is is governed over by Roman law. That magistrates have the right to make decisions. That you do not have a right to a trial by jury. Uh, that your peers do not choose uh, what is going to happen to you in a, in a criminal case. Um, that uh, you have much greater individual freedom under common law than you do under Roman law. L Roman law comes from the top. Common law proceeds from the bottom up. Uh, Roman law is, uh, is from the dictate of a powerful central political authority. Common law uh, is, is made by smaller regional areas. So then we have also the, the notion of limited versus absolute monarchies. That in the English system, even the king, as we will learn as we discuss Magna Carta, is under the law. That there is no one that is above the law in the English system and, and English notions of liberty. Though certain kings certainly believe themselves to be above the law. And in Latin America and throughout the rest of the New World, that there was an absolute monarchy. That the king of Spain and in all his might sat above the law and whatever he thought, whatever the law uh, was, or what he, he, whatever he deemed to be right was the law. And it was, it was given from the king to each viceroy, the viceroy of New Spain and the viceroy of Peru, who would then, it would descend down through a hierarchy of government officials and magistrates who could enforce this law arbitrarily. You do not have the same kind of system uh, in the New England colonies, but there is a belief that all had a, a right, or m many had a right to participate um, in, in uh, the government and the formation of, uh, of laws. And then, of course, uh, while in our own time the differences between in Christianity between Protestant and Catholic and Orthodox or whatever it might be uh, are, uh, are not as relevant as they once were. But in, in the world of the 17th and 16th centuries, these are enormous, uh, enormously important differences. Uh, that uh, to be a Catholic from the, uh, the English and British perspective was to be ruled over by an absolute despot out of Rome. That one could not read the Bible and discern what truths there were to be learned that God was communicating to the individual. Uh, but, uh, but this was to have Christianity imposed upon you uh, in, a, in a wrong fashion by a tyrant in Rome. Whereas Protestantism was much different in that each person, it was, it was asked that each person would read the Bible and interpret it for his or herself and that uh, through the guidance of, of ministers and the local congregation um, that, that this would be a notion of, of religious freedom, that you could come to know the divine on your own terms, not to be arbitrated through uh, the Roman Catholic Church. So here we see freedom not as a universal value, but something that is built upon a, a notion uh, of, of really English, English liberty here. So where does this all come from? So beginning uh, in the 5th century AD or CE, whichever you prefer, they both mean the same thing, groups of people, groups of, of Nordic as well as Germanic peoples began to immigrate to the island of Great, we now call Great Britain, or the Romans would have called Britannia. And they began to settle there, the Angles, the Saxons, and the Utes, as St. Saint B, uh, Saint Bede uh, uh, re reports to us. And these people began to form small rural communities. They did not live in large urban centers, um, but they lived out upon the land in small hamlets and farming villages uh, and 
these people, while they were warlike, initially began to settle all over uh, the English frontier. And they developed systems, uh, highly complex systems of justice uh, and of courts. And this is almost something that is almost mythical within the English imagination, that the Anglo-Saxons would elect from among themselves, they had this thing they called a witton, which was a council of wise men, that the greatest war leader among them uh, often, uh, or not often, but sometimes would be called a Bretwolda, a war leader of all of Britain, the ruler over all of Britain. And occasionally this title would come up, but they certainly had kings. And, and very often it was because of, the, of, the, uh, of this chieftain, chieftain's quasi-king uh, that uh, they took on the role of leading, uh, leading this particular group of, of people in a particular area of Britain. It might be even smaller than, than, uh, than England, it might be. Uh, Wessex or Sussex, something of that nature. It's a very small uh, regional area within England. And this leader would have counsel from this Witton. And the Witton, nevertheless, it possessed uh, power to then select the next king. Just because you were the son of the king did not mean necessarily you were the next king. But the Witton played an enormous role um, in this. And that landholders, if you held one hide of land, enough land in order to, um, to support a family, that you could, you could participate to some degree in your local governance, that they would call these hundreds, uh, which is, a, is if you have a county in England, it is broken up, or a shire, this is what they call them, the Anglo-Saxons did. If you have a shire, such as Gloucestershire or, or uh, Herefordshire, each of these shires is broken down into hundreds and uh, it might be various degrees of land but a hundred hides would equate uh, a hundred and then each hundred had its own uh, small court and people would come together to discuss uh, how uh, you know how to proceed against criminal proceedings or, or against uh, criminals uh, how they would order their their lands this uh, was a highly participatory system, and it went all the way up that you could take your case, you could plead a case against someone else who was a, a, uh, a landholder in the Anglo-Saxon world at the hundred level. You could appeal it to the Shire Court where the Shire Reeve, the sheriff of the county or the Shire, uh, would preside over this court who is a direct representative from the king and you could even appeal to the king's own majesty uh, um, himself although he was not very majestic in the Anglo-Saxon period. Um, so you can see here the beginnings of this notion of participatory government. This is not democracy, this is not popular government, but this is a notion that landholders and, and subjects of, uh, uh, or those who, are, who would define themselves as Anglo-Saxons would participate in the governance of this uh, land and realm under the king. That it was not an arbitrary sort of kingship, but it was to some degree uh, participatory. That the king gave laws and the king would, uh, w was also charged with protecting those under his control, um, that he would, he would maintain the good laws of the land. Um, so we see this as being a very important hallmark in the legacy of English freedom. But in 1066, William the Conqueror came across the sea and a Frenchman um, imposed this, uh, this, this man from Normandy, William the Bastard by birth, and William the Conqueror, King of England, uh, imposed a feudalism upon Anglo-Saxon society, that he was a very lucky man, uh, and he, w he succeeded in imposing a degree of feudalism, which, was, uh, which is a different form of government, much more arbitrary, uh, for the king is much more powerful uh, on the, from the top down, and, and uh, really rebuffing this notion of Anglo-Saxon uh, participatory government. So this was imposed upon... Uh, the, the English for a time. That being said, William agreed to confirm the laws that were made in the time of Edward the Confessor, one of the last king, Anglo-Saxon kings uh, of, uh, of England. And this is carried on down to us to one of the great successors of the Norman princes and Norman kings of England, King John, who was 
incredibly inept. King John was a weak king, and John had alienated every aspect of his entire society by the time that he, he is forced to sign this thing, this great charter of freedom, Magna Carta, as history will come to call it. And I want you just for a moment to place yourself back in time, and I want you to think about being in England on the Thames River just a short distance from uh, present-day uh, Oxford and present-day Windsor Castle in the meadow they called Runnymede on June the 15th, 1215. And King John of England has erected an enormous tent where he is to meet with his barons because he has been so inept that he has found himself excommunicated by the Pope in Rome. He has alienated the English church. He has alienated all his barons through his uh, ineptness and his mismanagement of government. And he's even alienated the freeholders, the yeomanry of England. All have risen up against King John as he has tried to rule as a tyrant. He has tried to make himself above these notions of English freedom that had carried on from the Anglo-Saxon period that have, have remained vestiges of the English past. And some historians will say that this is inaccurate. Some historians will say that there was an entirely new law, but I think Magna Carta is, uh, rebuffs this notion that there was this deeper and more profound sense of English freedom and liberty that still remained. And what does Magna Carta teach us? Because in 1215, the barons of the realm and the English church and the yeomanry of, of the realm brought forth to the king this charter of freedom. It wasn't called Magna Carta at the time. It was just called the charter. And in this document, King John is forced to accept the laws of Edward the Confessor. He is, or many of the laws of Edward the Confessor. And this means ultimately that he acknowledges that there are limits on royal power. And most importantly, that the king is not above the law, that the law is supreme and even the king has to obey it. So what are some of the most important provisions within Magna Carta? It separates the church and the state. The king is not the law, but the king is under the law. The king cannot exercise undue influence upon his barons, and he cannot exercise undue unlawful uh, intrusions into the church. The king also acknowledges in Magna Carta that Englishmen have certain fundamental rights, uh, rights that were defined as natural rights that are given from God. That, that is very much how uh, these people who wrote this document would have seen them, that they are fundamental rights, that through all time that these are given to humanity um, by the divine. And among these rights are a trial by jury, or, or, or excuse me, uh, that there are the, that uh, John does acknowledge that there are natural rights and that his, uh, that being an English person, uh, you have access to these natural rights. He also acknowledges within Magna Carta that certain individuals have a right to a trial by their peers, a trial by jury, basically. In Roman law, you do not have to know the charges that are levied against you, nor do you have a right to face your accusers. As in the Spanish Inquisition, you knew neither of these things. You had to guess at the charges and who, who, had, uh, who had levied these uh, accusations against you. But in the English common law, you always have a right to know your accusers and to know what charges are stand, uh, stand against you. You have a right to habeas corpus, present the body, that you cannot be arrested and held without due cause, and that you must be presented in a trial. You cannot be imprisoned without knowing your charges, and you must be brought forth to trial. Moreover, the king's agents king's agents, the king in all his might and majesty cannot enter your private property, seize your private property without due cause and without warrant. 
The king must also consult his subjects of the realm. He must consult parliament, which is the representatives of his, his realm, both in the, the lords and his barons, as well as the uh, lower subjects, uh, those who are uh, substantial landholders, the yeomanry of uh, the nation that will come to be the House of Commons. That the king must consult parliament if he wishes to tax. He has to ask for taxes, and the king has to ask if he wishes to raise an army. He has to consult his, his subjects. He cannot do these things arbitrarily as the kings of France, the kings of Germany, the, the Germanic nations can. And that there would be appointed a committee of barons who would advise the king and would ensure that the king followed the law. All of these things Magna Carta does. And finally, that Magna Carta says if the king violates these, these uh, provisions set forth in Magna Carta, if he breaks the law and violates, egregiously violates the law, then the barons and all the realm have a right to rebel against the king himself. The most important provision here is that the king is always under the law. Not even the king is ever above the law. And we should probably celebrate in the United States June the 15th in the same fashion that we celebrate July the 4th. Because this, uh, this document that was signed in, on June the 15th, 1215, was just as foundational to our sense of liberty as it is to, uh, to that of the English. And if you actually go to the National Archives and you can go to, to view the Constitution of the United States and the Declaration of Independence, as you come into the foyer there of the National Archives, you can actually see one of the original copies of Magna Carta, that we have placed this and enshrined this great charter of freedom in our own National Archives because it is the foundational document of English freedoms. So many kings would fight and push and quarrel with these notions of freedom that were laid forth in Magna Carta. They would occasionally win victories. And Simon de Montfort and, uh, raised an army against that of Henry III in the Middle Ages and, and was able to get Henry III to agree to the, the document of provisors that these freedoms were guaranteed in the high Middle Ages. But kings would continue to push against parliament and having to rule under the law and they would try to to become stronger and and the age of absolutism and during the 17th century was one of of great power and influence and there was a puritan fervor that was uh, swept across uh, england and unlike that of france where we began to see this as a, a age of, of great and enormous royal power, and that all over of Europe we began to see monarchies becoming more and more, uh, more hierarchical and, and more powerful, that uh, less influence is able to be exercised by people who are not uh, of the king's majesty. And, and eventually uh, Louis the, the 14th of France will, will say that what is the law? The law is me. I am France. The law is in my breast. Um, but in England... Uh, there was a, a strong reaction to this, and James I, uh, the first Stuart King of England, that uh, Queen Elizabeth, perhaps the greatest of all English monarchs, when she had passed away and, and her, uh, her next living relative, having no children of her own, was, uh, was James Stuart, the King of, of Scotland. And he comes down from Scotland to become King of the United Kingdoms, the kingdoms of Scotland and England, and he, he brings with him a notion of arbitrary rule, that he wanted to rule as an absolute monarch as he could in Scotland and not as, he, as the, the English tradition was, that he, would, uh, that he would have to govern with Parliament. And James gets himself into trouble, much like John does, because, as I said, there is a Puritan fervor 
that is sweeping across England, that there is a powerful uh, Protestant wind that is coming across England, that you, would, uh, you do not need bishops and you don't need all this church hierarchy, um, that every person should have uh, a Bible and they should read it and uh, that they need to interpret the Bible for themselves and individually. But James does not agree with this. He, uh, he believes in a strong and powerful hierarchical church uh, ruled by bishops that was almost Catholic. Uh, because being Catholic allows you to see being king, much like Louis the Fourteenth, uh, to see being king as you are God's appointed servant on earth, that you are the sword and the hand of God on earth, and therefore to question your judgment is to question God, uh, God Himself. So when monarchs began to clamor for divine right absolute rule uh, that uh, this is is uh, this smacks against uh, the English uh, tradition of, of limited rule that uh, you are you are king certainly but you are not an absolute monarch you are not God's anoint or you are not uh, you are not God's appointed ruler with absolute power but there are values that have been given by God that are absolute rights to all people and this will come out in, in the enlightenment even even more under John Locke but James tried to rule as an absolute monarch. And after he, uh, he bungled uh, uh, several chances with his, uh, the Duke of Buckingham, his, his uh, royal favorite who was exercising undue uh, foreign influence upon uh, the English crown and the English government, Parliament uh, rose up against James. And they would not allow him to rule arbitrarily, that he must call Parliament. Uh, ultimately, uh, he could not have a standing army like he wanted. He could not tax like he wanted. Uh, and he uh, uh, racked up enormous debts because of his refusal to work with, with Parliament because the king must live uh, and pay for the government through his own purse. And uh, in order to get the, the taxes that he needed to uh, allow the English government to function uh, in a much uh, a better sense than it had been, um, Parliament demanded, under the petition of right given in 1628, that James would remain under the law. He would consult Parliament um, and that he would guarantee the freedoms that had been outlined in ma that Magna Carta document in 1215. A later monarch, Charles I, when he becomes king, he is absolutely convinced that he does not need to rule through Parliament, that God has appointed him over all of the English, that he is an absolute monarch. And he does everything in his power to levy taxes and use every feudal due, everything within his, uh, his executive power to govern and rule without parliament. He needed to build a navy. And traditionally, there are seven little towns called the Sink Ports that uh, paid for the entirety of the English navy. And he also used, he tried to uh, levy money against all port towns in England uh, under this, uh, this, some of his executive power. And he fails to do this. And ultimately, uh, he, is, he gets into enormous trouble. Because he will not call Parliament. And, and he, eventually he is forced to call Parliament. He dismisses Parliament and continues to try to rule arbitrarily. So it comes to civil war. This is the English Civil War. And eventually the king's armies are overwhelmed by the Puritan Roundheads and Oliver Cromwell. Led by General Thomas Fairfax. And Oliver Cromwell will become the more famous of, of the two men, but Oliver Cromwell was the cavalry commander, man of middling sort, uh, and, uh, and all Puritans, right? That uh, the Church of England, as the, the king had become the head over the Church of England. This is, again, rebuffing this notion of separation of, of church and state, that Puritans believed that the king and the bishops, who were the servants of the king, appointed by the king, exercised undue influence over the church and that they had no right to do so. And 
For this reason, among others, they rose up against the king. And eventually, King Charles was tried at Parliament, where he sat in a chair. He refused to stand in the stocks. He refused to acknowledge Parliament's authority uh, to try him. He said that Parliament had no power over him. Charles misunderstood the notion of authority versus power. Maybe Parliament had no authority to try him, but they certainly had the power to try him, or much of Parliament did. And eventually, this king, Charles, he lost his head. He was executed for treason against the realm. Not treason against the crown, but treason against the realm. That this rump of parliament, those who had remained loyal to this notion of English liberty, said even the king is under the law, and he is bound uh, to, to obey the law that he cannot govern independently, he must govern with consent, and that he was a limited monarch and never an absolute monarch. This is the English tradition. And in order to defend liberty, because after the king is dead, the English system really does not know how to function. You cannot function without an executive. Uh, England is not a republic. You don't just elect a new king. That's not how this thing goes. It's a hereditary monarchy. So Oliver Cromwell, remember the cavalry commander and the great Puritan, he will become dictator in defense of liberty. And note a uh, note of caution here that if uh, uh, someone must become a dictator in order to defend liberty, uh, and therefore your rights are somewhat suspended by this defense of liberty, uh, throw some caution to the wind. Uh, eventually this doesn't work out, and the Stuarts return to the throne under Charles II. And when Charles dies, uh, his brother, the Duke of York, who would become King James II, who was a, a Roman Catholic, which is uh, absolutely out, uh, out, out of the question for the English, that a Catholic should sit on the throne. Uh, he comes to power and he tries to rule as an absolute monarch. This leads him into a civil war with the forces of, of Parliament again, as had Charles I. And James flees. He flees uh, being defeated on the battlefield. Uh, he flees across the English Channel to France. And on the way, he drops the great seal of, of England into the, into, the, uh, into the English Channel. And he believed that the government could not function without that seal and without him. And that they were wrong. That Parliament at this time decides that they would, would change everything. That they would ask someone else to be king. That they would offer the throne because they said that James had abdicated. He had abandoned the throne of England. Therefore, that meant he had abdicated his right as king. So they take the, uh, the crown away from the line of the Stuarts and instead they, they offer it to William of Orange and uh, the daughter of James, uh, James II, Mary Stuart. And they, in this offer, tell these, these two people that they, they say, in order to be king and queen of England, that you have to accept limits on your royal power. And you must guarantee, you must sign a document like Magna Carta before it, the Declaration of Rights of Englishmen. And these are the liberties that are set forth in Magna Carta, that you must govern through and with Parliament. You cannot rule arbitrarily. That Englishmen have certain natural rights that are given to them that there is a trial by jury, that you cannot hold people without right, that you cannot violate private property without warrant and due cause, that these are the great liberties set forth in 1688 in what they call the Glorious Revolution because it was almost entirely bloodless. That's why it's called the Glorious Revolution. And Parliament offers the throne and James, or excuse me, William of Orange and, and Mary, William and, or, and Mary uh, accept, and William of Orange is a... Is a a Dutch monarch, or he's a Dutchman, and he comes over and he is, he is 
anointed king of England with the consent of Parliament to become a limited monarch. It is uh, during this time that John Locke, the great, uh, the great writer and commentator on government, um, is, it, he lives and, and, uh, and writes his two great works, uh, two treaties on government. And he saw the Declaration of Right, that, that was put forth uh, to the, the, uh, the kings, uh, king and queen in 1688, he saw this Declaration of Right as simply a statement of natural law as the English conceived of it through uh, their long history. And he saw this natural law as something that was absolute, that it is true through all time, that, uh, that the Declaration of Right and Magna Carta and these freedoms of, of people, of individuals, uh, to be bound by the same laws as those who governed them um, were, were the same things that had been taught by Socrates, had been taught by Cicero, Epictetus, uh, the great thinkers uh, of, the, of the classical past. And John Locke boils this all down to three things. He says that these are the fundamental rights of English people, life, liberty, and property, that you can live your life in a pursuit of happiness, that you can, uh, you can be free, that you are free as an individual uh, to, to live as you choose as long as you are not being harmful to others, and that you have an absolute right to property that your property you can do with whatever you choose, that private property is something that is sacred, that you can dispense with it, you can keep it, that your property is protected um, by the government, and that is why that the government exists. Governments, uh, this is the social contract theory that John Locke comes up with. Governments are instituted by people to protect the rights of its citizens. That is why government exists, to protect life, liberty, and property. And uh, in the event that government becomes arbitrary, that it, uh, instead of protecting, it destroys these rights of citizens, um, that these, these citizens of the government or the subjects of the crown have a right to revolt against, these, uh, revolt against this government that has destroyed and taken uh, these notions of, of English liberty from them. And how is this decided? How is it decided when oppression has become so great uh, that it justifies revolution? Well, that is for the conscience of each individual person that you must be well schooled and taught Locke says that you must you must consider these matters deeply for it could cost you greatly as it had many in the past who who stood up for for freedom and liberty but ultimately that the individual is who decides when something is becoming arbitrary and I would encourage you to think back on a year a, a year ago at this point that the capital riots in Washington, D.C., the first time ever in the history of the United States uh, that, that a group of citizens tried to storm the Capitol, and storm the Capitol they did. Were these people exercising their, their God-given rights, the life, liberty, and property, they were defending their rights as citizens, or were they uh, themselves tyrants overthrowing a dutifully elected government? I think that there is some great questions to ask about this uh, in, uh, in this notion of, of freedom and the legacy of English liberty and what are the limits and, and the bounds that have to be placed upon this. This is worth thinking about. Because after the time of John Locke and the Glorious Revolution, there came another revolution. And the United States of America, as this new uh, upstart colonial uh, New England colonies would come to be known, um, they reasserted their rights as, as Englishmen, that they were simply living into this calling from John Locke, this belief of John Locke of, to, the, to a right uh, to rebel whenever they felt that they uh, were oppressed. By a, a, by a tyrannical government that had not protected their rights, but instead usurped their rights. Um, so they were pursuing their traditional rights in some cases here, that there was certainly a belief among Washington and Jefferson and Adams and, and uh, these people that, uh, that 
they were Englishmen and they had been denied um, the right to consent to taxation, that the king was acting as arbitrarily as James I or, or John I or, or James II, that they were, they were not being allowed to participate uh, in this government, that their traditional freedoms were being violated um, by, by a uh, oppressive government. So therefore, it was their duty as Englishmen to rise up against uh, this arbitrary form of government. And they were not uh, they were not traitors and scoundrels, but they were freedom fighters. That they were defending a sense of liberty that was far more profound than the English government had uh, had at times uh, uh, could understand. That it had become so corrupted um, that it had forgotten uh, these notions of liberty that were guaranteed in Magna Carta. And therefore, they put forth this statement in the Declaration of Independence issued on July the fourth, seventeen seventy six. And the opening lines to this document, they say this, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, endowed with certain inalienable rights, chief among these being the right of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. If someone is taking a history course in a thousand years from now, 500 years from now. I promise you that this will be the document that they read about the great American empire. That this will be what students will have a quiz on and they will be asked uh, to, to barf back. That they will be asked to know, well, what did it mean to be an American? I think if you would look to this long legacy of liberty, it would be in this Declaration of Independence. that following in the, the footsteps of a millennia of English people before them and their, uh, their great poet and inspiring uh, source, John Locke, that the founding fathers of the United States uh, came to see that their chief rights were natural rights, that they were guaranteed these things from God, that, the, that uh, you are guaranteed to the right of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Just like those uh, who fought in the Glorious Revolution, the English Civil Wars, and those who fought against King John uh, on, uh, in the Middle Ages. That these were fundamental rights, a legacy of liberty that was given uh, to these people. And that's, they very much saw that, which is why they were really willing to, uh, to risk their lives and their fortunes in order to pursue these legitimate rights. Then the, after winning the American Revolution, the founders of the New Republic enshrine what they believe to be the most important legacies of freedom in the Constitution in 1787 this great document of, of U.S. freedom. And in this is enshrined the profound legacy of these traditional English freedoms, that the Constitution of the United States made a new government without a king. It formed a republic instead of a monarchy. But it confirmed within this all the common laws, or most of the common laws, of England and these and the the main and chief provisions that were in within uh, within Magna Carta, and it, this document founded a new nation that would become a great world empire, and within this document there was a separation of church and state, just as was in Magna Carta. There was a individual freedom that was guaranteed within this document: the right to freedom of expression, speech, the press. There was a protection of private property that the government could not come into your home, could not quarter troops in your home, could not seize your property, could not seize your person, could not even search your home without, uh, without going to a magistrate and showing due cause. And that ultimately all government, including its leaders, are bound underneath this constitution, that everyone is under the law and answerable to the law, that all are equal under the law. 
this notion of egalitarian freedom, um, that uh, all people are, are equal in the same sense. This is not what the founders were talking about at all, that they are saying that everyone, everyone is bound under the law. All are equal only under the law. And this is a new law that was created. This was one that the people, the, the electorate, sets forth and gives to this new republic. But then we have to question, what is this notion of English freedom? How did those who were property, the human beings that were possessed by others, the, the slaves, uh, enormous numbers of slaves possessed by, uh, by those who had fought so, so gallantly for freedom, uh, like Thomas Jefferson and George Washington, and though... Uh, to their credit, of course, they, they do, in most cases, free their slaves at the end of their lives. But nevertheless, they owned and possessed human beings as property. These people did not enjoy the same freedoms that came from the English legacy of liberty. How were Native Americans treated? Well, they were dispossessed of their private property that is a fundamental right given by God. Um, and that they were enslaved in, in many cases. They were driven from their lands and marched all the way to Oklahoma under General Jackson on the Trail of Tears where tens of thousands died as they were uh, arbitrarily uh, forced out of their, their lands that they had, passed, or had possessed since time immemorial. Um, so this, this English legacy of freedom it only extends so far within the currents of the United States. And finally, women. How did, how did women play a role in this? That they uh, uh, would lose their property in the event that they uh, angered a, a husband or a father. Uh, that they could be sometimes, not entirely, but passed around as property. That they did not enjoy this same sense of, uh, of, of freedom that uh, did uh, English men of certain property classes. And also those who were lesser in, in social status, those who did not own a certain amount of land or, or uh, have a certain amount of education or, or clout within the society that they could not vote, they could not consent to the laws. Um, they were equal in theory under the law, but they could not, uh, they could not participate in government as, the, uh, as others uh, could. So what is uh, this, this great legacy of freedom? And it comes to a head. Uh, in the U.S. Civil War over the question of slavery and states' rights. The only reason it's states' rights is because it's about slavery. And uh, ultimately, uh, there it comes to be a great war over the question of individual freedoms. What is, is more powerful? Is it the individual freedom of every person to dispense with their property, even if that is human beings, or ultimately is it uh, is it all human beings have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? And I think this is what the great question is over. It is not over slavery. It is not over states' rights. It is over the question of these freedoms being applied to all people. Um, though states' rights and, and slavery is, is at, at its root, this is the great question of liberty and how it will be interpreted. So a large portion of the new American Republic rises up against each other, and a great war is fought, and eventually this war is ended. It is ended with enormous bloodshed, destruction of, of property. The soul of a nation is, is lost in some cases here. And... It ends with the North winning a, uh, a victory, strong, uh, a resounding victory over the South. And uh, the, as the South surrenders, I think there's a, a great scene where uh, it shows that uh, the power of this victory and the acceptance of defeat and an acceptance of this new notion of liberty as individual liberty, as being the, the victor of this war, and that is... General Robert E. Lee, the commander of the armies of the, of the Confederate Republic in the South, uh, 
after this is all over and the, uh, there is a, he goes to church. And church was notoriously segregated. And a former slave comes down to the front of the altar and he kneels to receive communion. And the priest, the Episcopalian priest who is presiding over the service is, does not know what to do. Never before had he served communion to a slave in a, in a white church with, with plantation owners in this place. And General, former General Robert E. Lee, in his suit and tie, he comes down and he kneels next to the slave. And he sticks his hands out and asks to receive communion. And the priest serves the slave, and then he serves General Lee. And in this individual free in this act i see general or i see individual freedom as being triumphant within the american system that it will take much much more work after this but this is the seeds of this legacy of liberty that has come down from the time of the anglo-saxons that all people have a a uh, a right to participate within their government, that, they, that there is a certain protections that are given to all human beings, that this was the great victory that was won in the U.S. Civil War. This was the legacy of English liberty. So I ask you to contemplate at the end of this lecture, how has the notion of English liberty, the, this great gift to humanity, how has this shaped, influenced, and profoundly affected the United States? And what is odd about this legacy of liberty? Is this something that is an undercurrent that is in everything, that seems to be a universal value, at least within the United States? Or is this just sort of a, a notion that is applied uh, when it is convenient at certain times in the past? So I hope you have enjoyed this lecture, and I hope that you have come to learn something uh, that is profound about this legacy of liberty in this, uh, in this place that you live in. Uh, so with that, I wish you all well, and I look forward to seeing you next time, where we will begin in the age of exploration. <laughs>